Walter McDougall is our next speaker, and you've already been introduced to Walter McDougall, so I thought I would just make a, a few personal comments. Um, he's, he's my mentor uh, as a history professor. Um, his, his writing is, is just superb. You know, yes, he's won a Pulitzer Prize, and a few other people have too, but it, it doesn't really get to the heart of, of what you need to understand about Walter's writing, especially in U.S. history. For those of you who teach either U.S. history or AP U.S. history, uh, Promised Land, Crusader State, and the current book just out, The Tragedy of U.S. Diplomacy, they're, they're really great readings for your students. They're essential readings for yourself um, to gain a deeper knowledge into U.S. foreign policy. And in addition to that, um, two other books, uh, Freedom Just Around the Corner and Throes of Democracy, are excellent for you and only your, your very best AP students because they are difficult. Um, unfortunately, uh, they're, they only take U.S. history up to 1877. I would, I would love to uh, have more works taking it to the present, but uh, publishing being what it is at the moment, uh, we'll have to settle for at least a, a thorough analysis of the beginnings through 1877. Um, in my, my humble opinion, uh, the first chapter in Freedom Just Around the Corner is the finest chapter of nonfiction I've ever read, period. All nonfiction, anything. Uh, and I really, really strongly recommend you read it. Also, Walter has lots of, uh, lots of papers that have been written for FPRI. They range, deal with geography, U.S. history, all kinds of topics, uh, way too numerous to mention. But go to FPRI.org, go to the website and uh, seek out a lot of them. Uh, they could really be helpful and enriching for your, you and your students. So uh, without further ado, Walter McDougall will be speaking about the Mexican War. He fell down. Oh my. I don't recognize this person who gets introduced. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican War in February 1848, transferred to the United States its entire Southwest, from the mouth of the Rio Grande on the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean north of San Francisco Bay. Most Americans were relieved that President James K. Polk pulled it off, thanks in good part to the Army and Navy's professional officer corps, plus a good deal of luck. But many, mostly Northern Americans, were ashamed of a war of conquest, a war that might also lead to the expansion of slavery. And that is what prompted an editor of the North American Review to rebuke the nation like the prophet Amos. This is criminal, he wrote, the besetting sin of the stock from whom, in the pride of our hearts, we claim to be descended. <clears throat> the English have appropriated a large share of all the territory inhabitable by the human family, and of these Englishmen, we are the true children. Even the patriots of 1776 were by no means exempt from the lust of dominion. Several of them were among the most noted land speculators of their time. Avarice and rapacity were as common then as they are now. The stock jobbing, extortion, low arts and devices to amass wealth that were practiced during the War for Independence seem almost incredible. Today, our territory is vastly more sufficient for the substance of those who inhabit it, but is still deemed by many too small to meet our future growth. If then, we have made no progress in virtue, the fault is our own, and the consequences <clears throat> will be upon our heads and upon those of our children." Unquote. Whoa. To be sure, those were the words of a genteel Yankee, the New England, whose emergence we learned about after the War of 1812. <clears throat> and he was writing, of course, for a highbrow Boston journal. But his essay thoroughly contradicted the message of most Americans, of Jacksonians, such as the New York-based editor of the Democratic Review, John O'Sullivan, 
who preached the pure catechism of what I call the American civil religion, with its articles of faith about the divine origins, destiny, and mission of the United States. The subject of O'Sullivan's 1839 article was the inevitable growth of what Jefferson had called the empire of liberty, foreseen by the founding fathers and indeed by all the prophets and priests of the civil religion. Listen closely to O'Sullivan's remarkable claims. Quote, the American people, having derived their origin from many nations and the Declaration of Independence being entirely based on the great principle of human equality, these facts demonstrate our disconnected position as regards any other nation, that we have in reality but little connection with history, its antiquities, glories, and crimes. On the contrary, our national birth was the beginning of a new history, the formation and progress of an untried political system which separates us from the past and connects us with the future only. And so far as regards the entire development of the natural rights of man in moral, political, and national life, we may confidently assume that our country is destined to be the great nation of futurity. What friend of human liberty, civilization, and refinement can cast his view over the past history of the monarchies and aristocracies of antiquity and not deplore that they ever existed? What philanthropist can contemplate the oppressions, cruelties, and injustice inflicted by them on the masses of mankind and not turn with moral horror from the retrospect? America is destined for better deeds. It is our unparalleled glory that we have no reminiscences of battlefields except in defense of humanity. Our annals describe no scenes of horrid carnage where men were led by the hundreds of thousands to slay one another as dupes and victims of emperors, kings, and nobles. We've had patriots to defend our homes and our liberties, but no aspirants to crowns or thrones, nor have the American people ever suffered themselves to be led on by wicked ambition. We have no interest in the scenes of antiquity, except as lessons of avoidance. The expansive future is our arena. We are entering on its untrodden space with the truths of God in our minds, beneficent objects in our hearts, and with a clear conscience unsullied by the past. We are the nation of human progress, and who will, what can, set limits to our onward march? Providence is with us, and no earthly power can. We point to the everlasting truth on the first page of our National Declaration, and we proclaim to the millions of other lands that the gates of hell, the powers of aristocracy and monarchy, shall not prevail against it. The boundless future will be the era of American greatness. In its magnificent domain of time and space, the nation of many nations is destined to manifest to mankind the excellence of divine principles, to establish on earth the noblest temple ever dedicated to the worship of the Most High, the sacred and true. Its floor shall be a hemisphere, its roof the firmament of the star-studded heavens, and its congregation a union comprising hundreds of happy millions, calling no man master, but governed by God's natural and moral law of equality, the law of brotherhood, of peace and goodwill amongst men." Unquote. Thus did John O'Sullivan invoke in politics what his contemporaries Ralph Waldo Emerson extolled in philosophy, Walt Whitman in poetry, and Henry Ward Beecher in theology. America was a holy church. His most famous phrase was made explicit six years later 
when he declared the nation's, quote, manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence to the free development of our yearly multiplying millions, unquote. <clears throat> manifest destiny became the motto, or really the mood, of the expansionist craze that gripped Americans in the 1830s and 40s. It's a curious phrase, manifest destiny, and the more historians try to pin down the mood it expressed, the more elusive it becomes. Such is the case with moods. Destiny is vague enough, implying some preordained destination lying sometime in the distant future. But the word manifest derives from the Latin manifestus, from which we get manifesto, <clears throat> meaning struck or gripped by the hand. Manifest connotes something readily perceived or touched, obvious and unmistakable. So manifest destiny seems contradictory, a kind of here and now future, a tangible abstraction. Not that national growth was anything new in 1839. Americans inherited the urge from the British, and they had embraced it from the start. In 1783, Franklin had won a peace treaty extending the U.S. border to the Mississippi River. In 1803, Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase expanded the U.S. to the Rocky Mountains. In 1812, as we heard, the Warhawks hoped to conquer Canada. In 1819, the Transcontinental Treaty with Spain ceded Florida to the U.S. and strengthened American claims to the Pacific Northwest, the Oregon Territory. But during that era, Many Americans also thought there might be limits to our expansion. After all, it had taken Lewis and Clark 18 months to trek from the frontier town of St. Louis to the Pacific, while a sea voyage from Boston to California all the way around Cape Horn took six to eight months. Surely, the federal government could never wield effective control over such distant lands. Even Jefferson suspected the Rocky Mountains might be the realistic limit to American growth. <clears throat> what made it possible to imagine a continental destiny was a transportation revolution. Canals and paved roads came first, followed by railroads. 5,000 miles of railroad track had already been laid by 1845. Samuel Morse's telegraph went into service in 1844. Steamships began to liberate sailors from their ancient slavery to the winds, currents, and tides. Moreover, America's exploding population, Paul mentioned this this morning, required Western expansion just to preserve opportunity for generations to come. Indeed, the economic imperative for manifest destiny gripped all geographic sectors. Yankee merchants, Yankee whalers, wanted Pacific ports of call to sustain their commerce with Hawaii, Alaska, and China. Midwestern farmers and new immigrants hungered for more fertile soil. Indeed, perhaps all the way out to Oregon. Southern planters, they hoped to expand their cotton kingdom along the Gulf Coast. But the literary movement, the John O'Sullivan wing of Manifest Destiny, it was steeped not in material interest, but in rhetorical mysticism. The mostly Northeastern writers who waxed religious about American expansion simply ignored the problems of diplomacy, sovereignty, and possibly war that expansion 
might entail. <clears throat> Indeed, they ignored the question of ways and means altogether. That's what dreamers of destinies gripped by moods usually do. They ignore stuff. Rather, the, this literary wing of manifest destiny held that U.S. expansion, oh, it would occur naturally through the peaceful spread of pioneers and or the desire of neighboring peoples to join America's Temple of Liberty. As Pennsylvania Senator James Buchanan pronounced in 1844, quote, Providence has given to the American people a great and important mission to spread the blessings of Christian liberty and laws from one end to the other of this immense continent, unquote. Why were Americans so sure that God had given them a mission and that their values and institutions were superior? Why ask? The proof seemed obvious in the fact that the U.S. was bustling with energetic people, developing land, resources, and technology, extolling freedom. Whereas the Spaniards had done almost nothing over 300 years to develop their provinces of Texas, New Mexico, and California. Almost no towns, no farms, no mines, no commerce. And the same was true of the Pacific Northwest. All oh, the Russians who were up in Alaska, they'd been there since the middle of the 18th century. But all they had done was to force the poor Aleuts to hunt otters and seals for them. While the British Hudson's Bay Company in Canada actually forbade agriculture and logging, lest that spoil the habitats of beavers, foxes, and bears. So it seemed inevitable that industrious American families would supplant the nomadic Indians, the monopolistic British and Russians, and the corrupt priest-ridden Mexicans, all of whom stood athwart the progress of civilization. But those assumptions of inevitability cloaked a harsher reality. In territories already possessed by the U.S., development often required dispossessing Indians. Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act had already passed in 1830. How much more unrealistic was the dream of peaceful expansion into lands contested or owned by foreign nations? Hence, manifest destiny could never really have been satisfied without some manifest design, a design for realistic diplomacy and maybe even war. That dilemma burst wide open in 1846, obliging Americans to confront, for the first time in their history, a self-consciously moral crisis in foreign policy. Now, expansionists might have been vague about means, but their explicit goals were clear. They included California, Texas, and Oregon. The first, California, had been pioneered by Franciscan missionaries in the late 1700s, and it was a province of Mexico, first of Spain and then of Mexico. But California contained only a few thousand mestizos who resented, frankly, the distant corrupt regimes in Mexico City. Texas was another Mexican province, but it soon began to fill up with rowdy pioneers and planters from the American South. And Oregon, Oregon was just a no man's land, almost empty of Euro-Americans and subject to multiple claims. Well, the Russians were the first to fall out of contention. They simply withdrew their claims to the lands south of Alaska. <clears throat> but the British 
continued to claim the whole territory south to California at 42 degrees north latitude. Uh, down, down here somewhere. Um, the United States, however, claimed all the lands north to 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude. Well, in 1818, the United States and Britain agreed to leave Oregon open to settlement by Americans and Canadians alike, which is what gave John Quincy Adams confidence, he was Secretary of State, that U.S. settlers would someday come to dominate the Columbia River Valley uh, and point south. <clears throat> Britain's Lord Castlereagh understood too, but he put it more crudely. The United States will win Oregon in the bedchambers of New England. Well, Adams lived to see it. By the 1840s, wagon trains filled with land-hungry pioneers were braving the new Oregon Trail, while Minnesota Senator, Minnesota had become a state in 1821, the pair of Maine, which have spun off from Massachusetts, one slave state, one free state, the, the Missouri Senator, Thomas Hart Benton, was regaling Congress with tales of the rich soil and soaring timber of the Pacific Northwest. By 1845, the 5,000 Americans in Oregon already outnumbered Canadians seven to one. And so, the British government offered to partition the territory along the Columbia River. The United States countered by offering, well, maybe we'll partition it at the 49th parallel. And so, no agreement was reached. The second target of Manifest Destiny was Tejas, as it was known then, Tejas, Texas. As late as 1820, the thickets, prairies, and hills west of the Sabine River were almost empty, except for fierce Comanche and Apache tribes, which is what dissuaded Mexicans from trying to pioneer there. The Spanish government had feared losing Texas to the grasping Americans, which is why it had insisted that John Quincy Adams renounce any claims to Texas in that transcontinental treaty of 1819. But two years later, Mexico became independent, and its leaders made a momentous decision. Since Anglos are sure to infiltrate anyway, sooner or later, why not invite some American Moses, in fact, it was Moses Austin, to lead an exodus into Texas, but under the terms of a covenant with the Mexican government? The Mexicans would issue generous land grants to Austin on condition that his settlers swear allegiance to Mexico and become Roman Catholics. How realistic was that? All these Scots-Irish frontiersmen from the Appalachians and southern planters, almost all of whom were Protestant of one kind or another, are supposed to go to Mexico and swear allegiance to the Mexicans and join the Catholic Church? Well, Moses Austin died before his exodus could reach the promised land. But his son Stephen Austin took up the offer. And what happened, of course, was that thousands of legal and then illegal immigrants swarmed into Texas with no intention of bowing to any officials or priests. Illegal immigration. It was the same crisis of a long, unpoliced border the U.S. suffers with Mexico today, only in reverse. By 1830, some 20,000 uh, 20, Americans had staked claims in Texas and begun to demand political rights. In 1836, the friction burst into flame when General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, 
imposed a military dictatorship in Mexico. The Texans, like the 13 colonies before them, protested these intolerable acts. Whereupon, Santa Ana, like King George before him, tried to impose his will. Whereupon, Texans, like the Minutemen, formed militias and then summoned a Congress which declared independence. Whereupon, Santa Ana marched an army over the Rio Grande and slaughtered the garrisons captured at Goliath and at the Alamo in San Antonio. But the makeshift Texan army rallied under the recent em immigrant from Tennessee, Sam Houston, their own George Washington. The army, the, the Texans, routed the Mexicans at San Jacinto and captured Santa Ana himself. Sam Houston, hoping to win independence and peace, released the general on condition that he recognized Texan independence. Santa Ana promised. But once he got safely home to Mexico, he broke his word and swore vengeance. And so Houston, now the president of the Republic of Texas, petitioned for American statehood. President Andrew Jackson's last act in office was to recognize Texan independence. And his hand-picked successor, Martin Van Buren, expected to push statehood through Congress. Only there was a problem. Another great trend, another great wave, another great mood or movement in American history had sprung up, coincident with Manifest Destiny, abolitionism, or at least opposition to the expansion of slavery. To tell the truth, most Northerners, not to say Southerners, opposed strict abolition, which incidentally had just recently been adopted by the British Parliament without any quarrel, without any fight, without any civil war, abolished slavery throughout the entire British Empire, but the United States with its federal system, its separation of powers, its checks and balances, the United States couldn't do that. No one in the United States wielded the power that the British Parliament wielded, simply by whatever it said when it was law. And everyone recognized that abolitionism would create a tremendous crisis, a massive assault on private property a massive assault on the Constitution. However, most Northerners did oppose the extension of slavery into new territories and states. Now, East Texas was good cotton country. We're talking about the Gulf Coast down here. Excellent cotton country, an extension, really, of Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama. And the, the Texans had legalized slavery in their constitution. So President Van Buren realized a treaty to annex Texas probably would never achieve a two-thirds majority in the Senate. That meant that the Texan Republic, the Lone Star Republic, or the Buckskin Republic, as it was called, remained in limbo for a decade. And that pleased no one more than the British, who wanted an independent Texas to arise in order to check the alarming expansion of the United States, a containment policy. So British diplomats, and I've been to the PRO in, in London and I've seen these documents, they're fascinating, British diplomats in Texas and in Mexico urged the Mexicans to recognize Texan independence, to dissuade the Texans from seeking statehood, and the British offered copious financial and economic aid to both countries. Well, how was it then that the U.S. government managed to thwart Great Britain and Mexico 
by grabbing not only Texas, but California and Oregon too. <clears throat> well, the answer to that, the deep answer to that, lay in the turbulent evolution of U.S. domestic politics. The Federalist Party was long extinct, done in by their opposition to the War of 1812. <clears throat> but Jefferson's party, the Democratic Republicans, had since split over the course of the late teens and early 1820s into factions, the, the Democratic Republicans, but also the National Republicans. The Democratic Republicans, by the time of Andrew Jackson's election in 1828, took to calling themselves just the Democrats or the democracy. And during the 12 years of Jacksonian rule, a new party arose, the second U.S. party system, based on the Democrats and the Whigs. They chose their name Whig <clears throat> to imply that the Democrats had become a corrupt tyranny under King Andrew and his successors. Such Whig leaders as Henry Clay and Daniel Webster stood for many things. The idea that they were just a catch-all party of opposition is false. They stood for a strong federal government, for support for internal improvements, a high tariff to protect U.S. industry, and no expansion of slavery. But the Whigs did borrow one thing from the Democrats, their rough-and-tumble style of politics. Because the Jacksonian Democrats had demonstrated beyond all shadow of a doubt that the old elite politics of deference to the, 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 the Adams of New England or uh, the, the Virginia dynasty and all the rest, that was gone. The way to win elections in the United States was to mudsling, was to demagogue, was to out banter your enemy, to accuse your enemy of corruption and all kinds of terrible vice. Hence, William Henry Harrison's log cabin and hard cider campaign of 1840, in which the Whigs ran as the populists and handed out free booze at their rallies. The word booze dates from this campaign of 1840. Voter turnout in 1840, not surprisingly, was the highest in American history. <laughs> and it swept Van Buren from office. However, footnote to history, the old Dutch patroon from the Hudson Valley did give Americans and the world a parting gift. Do you know what it was? Well, the Van Burenites had formed a club named after the president's hometown of Old Kinderhook, New York. They called this the OK Club, and they bequeathed to the world the all-purpose neologism, it's OK, he's OK, he's one of our men. OK, OK. Harrison, however, caught pneumonia at his inauguration and died a month later. That made Vice President John Tyler, an instant lame duck. A lame duck because, in fact, he wasn't really a true Whig. He was an old Jeffersonian Republican who was opposed to Andrew Jackson for other reasons, and he was put on the ticket just to try to broaden the base. Now, to the Whigs' chagrin, he'd become president. So the Whigs didn't want him to run again. The Democrats sure as hell wanted him out. And the Democrats de determined the way to win back the White House was to run on this new popular mood of manifest destiny. So they called for annexation of both Oregon and Texas. And they made 1844 the first election since 1812 dominated by foreign policy. After nine ballots, the Democrats nominated James Knox Polk of Tennessee, Jackson's protege, in fact, who was known as Young Hickory. Polk's campaign slogan, 54-40 or fight, implying 
he would go to war rather than surrender any of Oregon to the British. His opponent, the Whig candidate, was another popular Westerner, Henry Clay. And the election was a nail-biter. Here you see the chart. But Polk won, narrowly, and he declared his victory a mandate for manifest destiny. Tyler, outgoing President Tyler, who was known as his accidency, agreed with that. He decided that the people had spoken in favor of manifest destiny. And in hopes of leaving some legacy for himself, he proposed to Congress that statehood, Texas statehood, be achieved through a joint, res re joint resolution of Congress. That would require only a bare majority in each house, rather than a two-thirds majority, a treaty required in the Senate. Whigs cried, that's unconstitutional. And they were probably right. But Congress passed the measure by slim margins, and Tyler signed it three days before leaving office. Now, let's pause the story for a few minutes and say a word, a few words, about Mexican politics. Because, as Thucydides knew, it almost always takes two to make a war. The truth was, Americans and Mexicans both held each other in contempt. Now, as of 1821, when Mexico gained independence, its land area was as large as that of the United States. Its population was two-thirds as large. Its standing army was much larger, and its economic prospects were enough to entice British investors. But just 20 years later, by the early 1840s, oh my, Mexico was a basket case. Its people, 80% of whom were impoverished Indians and mestizos, were not growing in number. And the peonage most of them endured on the landed estates of the Creole Hidalgos was little better than slavery. The Spaniards had built just one decent road that linked Veracruz on the Gulf Coast with Mexico City, and even that one road was regularly plundered by bandits. The only commodity worth the trouble of exporting was silver. The Republic had been founded by patriots, and many of those patriots admired the liberal Spanish Constitution of 1812. But liberalism was anathema to the Hidalgos, the big landowners, the Creole, the Spaniard, Spanish elite, to the army, and to the church. Mexican governments were also in debt, always in, in debt, and ended up relying more and more on their plundering generals to exert any authority over the provinces. And foreign investors, so hopeful at first, were hardly encouraged by Mexican mobs who would, who would cry out, Meron los extranjeros, extranjeros, death to the foreigners. Yankee go home, even British go home. Well, Mexican politics resolved down to a struggle among three political factions. The liberals, who were called puros, favored decentralized federalism, disestablishment of the church, and civil militias, all of which sounded very Jacksonian. But puros were also fierce patriots, bent on reconquering Texas. They even imagined that war against the, against the Yankees was the best way to forge Mexicans into a nation. Again, an echo of what we heard about the War of 1812. Well, a second faction, a conservative faction, 
favored, not decentral, since decentralized, but centralized government, and not disestablishment of the army and the church, but elevation of the army and the church. And the conservatives, however, were equally hostile to the Anglos. They had that one thing in common with the Puros. Only the third moderato faction, the moderates, favored peaceful relations with the U.S. A perfect Mexican standoff. And it was further complicated by the Caudillo phenomenon in Latin American history, and indeed Hispanic and Latin American history. Thus, General Santa Ana, who had seized power, was now deposed by the conservative general Bustamante, who in turn was deposed when Puros staged a lower class revolt in 1840. That sufficiently frightened conservatives to restore Santa Ana to power, which provoked the Moderados to launch yet another coup in 1844 that established an ephemeral parliamentary regime, but again led by a general, General Herrera. Well, for a few moments, for a few months in 1844-45, it seemed <clears throat> that the Mexicans might be finding their footing under this parliamentary regime. General Herrera pledged stability. He pledged reform. He was prepared to recognize the Republic of Texas so long as it remained independent. But in March of 1845, when Tyler persuaded Congress to admit the Lone Star State, General Herrera really had no choice but to break diplomatic relations with the United States. Texas was a rebellious province. It had now been annexed by a foreign power. And so the Mexicans broke diplomatic relations. Now all of these events, the Mexican politics, the diplomacy with the U.S., the Texas Revolution, all of this stuff had been closely monitored by the British and the French. Their diplomats had galloped inland from Galveston to the uh, to Washington on the Bra Brazos, which was the name of the first Texas capital, a little, cow, a little a, not even a cow town, uh, uh, basically just a, a crossroads in the countryside, uh, with a shack uh, where the uh, uh, where the where the uh, the first Texas government presumably met, and the British and the French urged the new Texas president, Houston's successor, whose name was Anson Jones to refuse the Americans' offer and to make a treaty with Herrera instead. The Mexicans are willing to recognize Texas now, make a deal with them. And Anson Jones promised to consider it. And that is where matters stood when James K. Polk was inaugurated. Polk didn't waste a day. At his very first cabinet meeting, he decided the Texans must be pressured to join the U.S. at once, and he instructed the U.S. envoy, Andrew Jackson Donaldson, to promise the Texans federal protection, federal funds, and federal patronage. The U.S. Commodore, Naval Commodore Robert F. Stockton, then sailed into Galveston Harbor, claiming the Mexican army is mustering to invade. Wasn't true, but that's what he said. But contrary rumors, he didn't lie, just got wrong information. But contrary rumors also arrived to the effect that the Mexicans had agreed to recognize Texas independence. But not only if they refused to join the United States, the Mexicans were also, the rumor had it, uh, insisting that the Texans accept a southern boundary on the Nueces River instead of the Rio Grande. And indeed, the Nueces River, about halfway down to the Rio Grande, <coughs> was pretty much the limit 
of, of Anglo-American settlement. Donaldson pleaded for U.S. troops to stiffen the Texans' res resolve, send them, put armies on the Sabine River, uh, give the Texans indications the United States will help. And President Polk promised prompt and energetic measures. He ordered General Zachary Taylor to lead a corps of observation into Texas and deploy as close to the Rio Grande as, quote, prudence will dictate, unquote. Was he trying to provoke a war? Was this an example of presidential powers gone, run wild? Well, yes and no. Historians have, have found no evidence that Polk was plotting a war. Indeed, he made no preparations for war. And he probably just hoped to deter Mexican belligerence. And if so, Polk won his bet, or seemingly did, when in Mexico City, the Puros attempt at another coup failed to topple the peace-minded Herrera government. And so the Mexican War Party was in temporary eclipse during the critical month when the Texas Convention finally voted for statehood, drafted a constitution, and prepared to join the United States as soon as Congress convened in December. Meanwhile, tensions with Great Britain threatened to boil over. In his inaugural address, Polk restated the demand for the Oregon boundary at 54 degrees 40 minutes. The British snubbed that demand. Congressional hawks, including Indiana's Andrew Kennedy, then cried, Shall we pause in our career or retrace our steps because the British lion has chosen to place himself in our path? Has our blood already become so pale that we should tremble at the roar of the king of beasts? Nay, let him rub his nose in the talons of the American eagle, and his blood will spout as from a harpooned whale, unquote. Don't you miss the good old spread eagle rhetoric of the 19th century? Can you imagine any member of Congress speaking in such terms today? Well, well, maybe a few. Threats and bluffs were exchanged for 18 months between the U.S. and Britain. But by 1846, now we're into the, 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 the second full year of, of Polk's administration, time began to work against the United States. Yeah, Americans are filling up Oregon, uh, clearly, you know, they're, they're, the British aren't going to be able to claim southern Oregon. But now, even the feisty Polk dared not risk conflicts against Britain and Mexico at the same time. Luckily, at that very moment, Parliament was engaged in hot debate over abolition of the Corn Laws. This is why you can never separate American history from world history, or particularly European history. Alas, most of our curricula do separate them. I myself have to teach U.S. diplomacy one semester, European another semester, and you know, try to weave these connections together when they become unavoidable. Great Britain, at that moment in history, was bitterly debating whether or not to do away with the tariffs against imports of foreign agricultural goods. The squirearchy in the House of Lords, the land-owning elites in Great Britain, had always managed to, uh, to uh, persuade Parliament, to lobby Parliament, to keep the tariffs high against imports of grain, from, which is what the British call corn, from foreign countries. But now the free traders, the liberals in Britain, were arguing for Britain to go completely free trade 
uh, in order to promote, in part, industrial exports from Britain to countries that would uh, export agriculture in return. And Foreign Secretary Aberdeen, Lord Aberdeen, decided the last thing the, go the government needs in this crisis is this Oregon controversy. And so he decided to liquidate it. He proposed yet another compromise, fixing the boundary at the 49th parallel, which simply extended the U.S.-Canadian border along the same line from where it already was further east. Polk, uh, the Polk administration drafted, this, drafted these terms into a treaty and rushed it to the Senate, which gave its advice and consent by a vote of 38 to 12. So all the whole 5440 or fight stuff, uh, all, the, all the old debates about Oregon going back to John Quincy Adams times were liquidated just like that. The United States relinquished the future Canadian province of British Columbia, but it gained the future states of Oregon and Washington. Meanwhile, Polk kept a close eye on the grandest real estate prize of all. Not many Americans were aware of California, but many in the elite were. American sailors like Captain Charles Wilkes of the Navy and Richard uh, Henry Dana, a famous author, had regaled the public with accounts of the beauty and value of California, especially San Francisco Bay. By 1845, several thousand Yankees had veered off the Oregon Trail to settle in the Sacramento River Valley. One immigrant wrote, let the tide of immigration flow toward California, and the American population will soon be sufficient to play the Texas game. Polk meant to grab California, whether he played the, the Texas game there or not, before the Mexicans could reinforce it with so soldiers, or before the nefarious Royal Navy always cruising around offshore everywhere around North America, trying to contain the United States before the, United, before, before the Royal Navy could land and stake a British claim to California. In fact, Polk launched four initiatives in hopes of raising the stars and stripes over California. First, he sent a diplomat, John Slidell, to Mexico City with an offer to purchase California, and, if possible, New Mexico. Second, Polk sent secret orders to Thomas Larkin, the U.S. consul in the California port of Monterey. The orders told him to outfit a Yankee militia among the pioneers who'd penetrated Northern California. Inside a Mexican province, he's stirring up a Yankee revolt. Third, Polk sent Lieutenant John C. Fremont, the famous Army Pathfinder and indeed the son-in-law of Senator Thomas Hart Benton, on a reconnaissance mission that really amounted to a stealth infiltration of the, prov the Mexican province of California. And fourth, when Slidell's dipl diplomatic mission failed, Polk ordered General Zachary Taylor in March to deploy his observation force all the way down on the Rio Grande. But it takes two to make a war. And something else happened in January 1846 that made war not only possible, but likely. <clears throat> Mexico's kaleidoscopic politics shifted again when a conservative anti-American general named Mariano Paredes, overthrew the Moderado regime, boasting that he would reconquer all of Texas. In 1846, Paredes sent reinforcements to Matamoros on the southern bank of the Rio Grande, including cavalry, which ambushed a U.S. patrol. 
killing 11 Americans. General Taylor's report traveled by horseback, steamboat, stagecoach, and railroad, arriving two weeks later in Washington. The skirmish gave Polk the pretext he needed to send the Congress a war message claiming American blood has been shed on Amer has been spilled on American soil. The Whigs sm smelled a rat, demanded to see the documents proving that Mexico was to blame, and calling for a national debate on whether to go to war. But Polk, ignoring James Madison's 1812 example, did not make a full disclosure and ordered his Democrat majority to close off debate after one day. Congress then stampeded into war by votes of 174 to 14 in the House and 40 to 2 in the Senate. Why did all the Whigs go along with him? Because they remembered the fate of the Federalists in the War of 1812 and realized voting against war, against our troops in harm's way, would seem unpatriotic. Thus did Polk exploit the allegedly peaceful doctrine of manifest destiny to justify a war for the purpose of conquering a third of Mexico. But, once again, the fact remains the Mexicans contributed to their despoliation by refusing to recognize Texan independence, then refusing to negotiate over the boundary, then firing the first shot, which allowed the Americans to pose as victims. Of course, most Americans did think their nation was destined to expand across the continent. What all Whigs and most Democrats didn't want to face up to were the methods needed to achieve it. Well, getting into the Mexican War proved much easier than getting out. Typical American uh, constant theme in our history. To be sure, the war lasted just 21 months, but that was enough to try public patience. With costs and casualties mounting, voters returned a Whig majority in the elections of November 1846, and won a one-term congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln introduced the so-called spot resolutions, asking the president to reveal the exact spot where he alleged American blood had been shed on American soil, while Congress as a whole censured, quote, a war unnecessarily and unconstitutionally begun by the President of the United States, unquote. Northern Whigs then began to suspect the Democrats had plotted this war to expand slavery westward. And that myth, I say a myth because historians have never found hard evidence for it, became universally taken for granted after the Civil War. But at the same time, 1847, a sizable faction of Northeastern Democrats assuaged their consciences by styling this war a humanitarian crusade. They launched an all-Mexico movement, arguing that if the U.S. must fight a protracted war against an implacable enemy, why not annex all of Mexico and uplift its benighted Catholic population to emulate Anglo-Saxon civilization. They claimed the U.S. had a duty to send teachers, preachers, engineers, businessmen, and lawyers, along with its soldiers, to export democracy, to nation-build. Polk saw this, this all-Mexico movement as just the sort of temptation that John Quincy Adams had warned against when he said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Well, was Polk on the right side of history or the right side of ethics and morality in that particular case? Not really. He was a te Tennessee slave trader. He, his heart bled for no Indians, no Mexicans, and no Africans. But Polk simply wanted no more and no less than what national, the national interest required. 
which was Texas, California, and the lands in between. But in conclusion here, a couple pages, what Polk most needed was an exit strategy. And what saved his war was, was, were the stunningly competent 1847 campaigns led by General Winfield Scott and General Zachary Taylor. Ably, ably assisted, I might add, by such West Point graduates as young Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, George McClellan, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, James Longstreet, Joe Johnston, and P.T. Beauregard. Scott's army defeated far larger Mexican forces in a whole series of battles and occupied Mexico City, where the latest junto, claiming legitimacy, at last came to terms with the U.S. diplomat Nicholas Trist. Trist sent home, here's Scott's army in Mexico City, first American army uh, 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 to capture a foreign capital. Uh, Trist sent home the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of February 1848, which ceded all of Texas plus all the real estate that would later become New Mexico, Arizona, and California, plus parts of the future states of Oklahoma, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. The Mexican session added half a million square miles to the U.S., increasing its area by a third. In return, the U.S. paid Mexico $15 million, which the Whigs called conscience money. But Polk's conscience was clear. He judged the treaty a godsend, not only because it ended the war with success, but because it scotched the all-Mexico nonsense. And sure enough, the Senate advised and consented 38 to 14 in March of 1848. What were its legacies? In geopolitical terms, the Mexican War needs no explanation. The U.S. was strong, Mexico was weak. For Americans to sit on their hands while vast realms of contiguous land lay idle would have contradicted the American character, even if that generation had not been drunk on the elixir of manifest destiny. But let's ask ourselves, did Polk really manifest the destiny that had been foreseen? Well, let's see. First, the literary prophets of Manifest Destiny believed expansion would be peaceful and benign. That was utopian. Hardball diplomacy and even war was what realized Manifest Destiny. Second, the Dreamers had demanded all of the Oregon Territory. But Polk and the Senate compromised on that fantasy when they cut a deal to partition Oregon. Third, the All-Mexico Zealots were frustrated when Polk and the Senate grabbed a treaty that gave the U.S. what it needed and left the rest of Mexico to fend for itself. So Polk clearly exploited the mood of manifest destiny, but his blunt diplomacy contradicted its irenic spirit. What was the legacy of, there's a treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, what was the legacy of the Mexican War? In the long run, the answer is the United States that we know and love today, a sunbelt republic whose centers of gravity have become the former Spanish provinces of California, Texas, and Florida, plus a Pacific power as well as an Atlantic one, plus a superpower on a global scale. But not a few Northerners choked on the justifications for the Mexican War because they imagined or wanted to imagine the U.S. a peaceful, idealistic nation and because their own free soil principles were undercut by the expansion of slavery to Texas and who knew where else. Hence, the short-run legacy of the Mexican War was a house divided. Ralph Waldo Emerson likened it to swallowing a dose of arsenic. Satirist James Russell Lowe wrote, they just want this California so as to lug new slave states in. And ancient Albert Gallatin, 
who had served as Jefferson's Secretary of the Treasury, scorned these allegations of racial superiority or manifest destiny are pretenses to disguise ambition, cupidity, vanity, unquote. Over the succeeding 170 years, historians have lurched back and forth between spread eagle pride over the Mexican War and abject shame. The Civil War, Spanish-American War, the World Wars, Vietnam War, Hispanic Civil Rights Movement have all radically changed our perspective on the, last, the 19th century war against Mexico. But in fact, such schizophrenia was there from the start because the moment when old glory first flew over Mexico City, a foreign capital, was also the occasion when American citizens began to purchase American flags in large numbers, mass-produced flags, and display them with pride. And it was also the, movement, the, the moment when American civil religion, rent by many citizens' guilt over the war, began to fall into irreparable schism. A direct line runs from the Mexican War to the Civil War. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I leave any time for questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. McDougall. Uh, Brian Harding, my community college, Flint, Michigan. Um, th I have a more narrow question than the geopolitics that uh, you so eloquently have uh, introduced us to, to the, in the period. I was wondering, and this is uh, compared to the War of 1812 experience, uh, we see in, in this time now, uh, some generation later, the United States uh, under General Scott and the U.S. Army is able to invade a country, Mexico, and repeatedly win battles against numer numerically superior forces defending their own country. I was just wondering how that happened. Or how, why was the United States able to win all those battles in Mexico? Paul, can you, you want to come up here and answer that one? Uh, you're more. Okay. Uh, because uh, he knows a lot more about uh, tactics and strategy than I do. But uh, the Mexican army, uh, on paper, was the superior force. It was much larger. Uh, many of the Mexican soldiers they were veterans of various wars, civil and whatnot, uh, and, uh, and it was a professional army for the most part. Um, uh, and so the Mexicans went to war, again, going back to the previous theories that we heard, thinking they were going to win. Why did the Americans go to war thinking they were going to win? Well, I don't know how many did think they were going to win, but the only war preparation that Polk made was to sort of send messages to the governors of a few southern states like Mississippi uh, uh, to call up their militias just in case. So there's, you know, it's not really clear whether Polk expected a war, a big, you know, a serious war to break out. But once the war got going, uh, the 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 well. The Mexican War was the coming of age of West Point. The, 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 the professionally trained officers leading the small professional American army, as usual, the militias did a pretty horrible job. Uh, it was John Quitman and the Mississippi militia was the only one that was sort of, you know, distinguished itself. Um, but uh, the, the professional army de deployed firepower uh, that was very effective against the, the Mexicans. They, they, the Americans had developed these, this, uh, so, well, we would call it the horse artillery now, the flying artillery, uh, battlefield guns uh, that could be moved very swiftly and set up very swiftly. Uh, and, um, uh, and that flying artillery uh, did uh, serious damage to the Mexicans time and again. I assume the Mexican army never really got its act together in terms of uh, concentrating its forces, because when Winfield Scott landed, and the, the Navy gets great credit for this, the Navy um, uh, transported Scott's army to Veracruz and landed it there, bombarded the fortress, and, uh, and, and secured a beachhead uh, in a uh, you know, very precocious fashion, you might say. And, um, and then Winfield Scott 
uh, marched inland all the way to Mexico City fighting a whole series of battles against superior Mexican forces. Um, but, uh, 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 but, the, but the Mexicans, as I say, were, they never concentrated. So their, 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 their superiority in numbers, I don't believe, ever became as overwhelming as it should have been. And there were political you know, conflicts among the, you know, the Cadillos. Uh, and uh, so I would, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, again, I'll defer to Paul, but uh, I think the Americans were, the Americans, the, the officer corps, Navy and Army showed great skill um, at professionalism. Uh, but there's no question that the Americans were just dumb lucky. Uh, you know, and... Uh, uh, time and again, General Wellington, who was very old at that time, I, I believe, but uh, but General Wellington, reflecting on the on Scott's march to Mexico City, said it was the greatest campaign uh, of the of that era, uh, or words to that effect. Um, a magnificent campaign, um, uh, and in retrospect, it was. But at the time. Um, you know, it was, you know, uh, I think it came as a surprise uh, to many, if not most, Americans. Does that, is that roughly accurate or at least not? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Walter, I just wanted to add the role of the telegraph, the American adaptation of the European invention, and that was really indispensable logistically and communication-wise, and you could see the difference from the War of 1812 to the Mexican War. Uh, you educate me, Paul. Did 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 the did the, did Scott's army string telegraph wire from Mex from Veracruz inland? I I don't know how much they did in Mexico itself, but I know Polk was fully appraised step by step of everything going on. Right. You know, as compared to the treaty right. again, you know, right. <laughs> and then the battle of New Orleans. In fact, the, the very first use of Samuel Morse's telegraph in 1844 was to broadcast the results of the Democratic Convention from Baltimore to Washington. Polk nominated, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's just a, a fascinating footnote to history. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's John Cluse from Sarah School in Lexington, Kentucky. You talked about the, uh, uh, following the Mexican War, uh, people criticizing Manifest Destiny as being a tool to expand uh, slavery and that kind of thing. But I'm wondering, in the early years of the formation of that idea, John O'Sullivan, et cetera, did anybody raise concerns about Native Americans or slavery as they were talking about the Holy Church that was America and creating the, the U.S. myth that you talked about at the beginning of your, your discussion? Did anyone talk about it in those terms? They raised those questions about, you know, the slaves or Indians. Or yeah, they, oh yes, uh, the, 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 debate, the debate over Indian policy, this, this didn't have much to do with the Mexican War, although it should have been, because the Americans... Many Americans were arguing that, well, the Mexicans aren't a real nation. They're not real, you know, they, they claim to be independent, but they're really just a bunch of Indians. So we can't expect them to be able to govern themselves. That was, that was one of the arguments behind the all-Mexico movement, uh, which, you know, posed as a humanitarian movement. And maybe in some people's minds it was uh, it considered uh, seriously uh, a humanitarian uh, 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 aspiration, but the flip side of nation building is paternalism, or a kind of an assumption of superiority uh, on your own part. And uh, but otherwise, otherwise, uh, Native Americans did not really enter into the Mexican War in any major way. Uh, they they were sort of players uh, on the fringes in some of the uh, Western campaigns. Uh, the, the march of the Mormon battalion, for instance, all the way to Santa Fe and then to California, uh, encountered Native American tribes. But, um, but, the, but the principal thing is, to answer your question, uh, there was a great debate uh, leading up to Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act over what are we going to do with the Native Americans. We heard about the War of 1812. Uh, you know, there were always kind of two kind of uh, default positions in American history. One is clear them out, and the other is assimilate them. And uh, wa everyone from Washington to Andrew Jackson had positions uh, on Indian policy that they deemed to be the least 
inhumane. The, the, you know, the way we should treat the Indians is to assimilate them. No, they don't want to be assimilated. Or uh, assimilation just brings them into more direct contact with the white populations around them, and that leads to violence and injustice. You know, what can we do? Uh, and, um, and Jackson claimed always he had Indian friends. I think he had an adopted child who was a Native American. Uh, Andrew Jackson always claimed that this was the most humane way to, to deal with the Indians, is just to get them out of the way. Let them live their own lives, uh, but get them out west, where they won't be in constant friction with the whites. Well, as we all know, that led to the Trail of Tears. Uh, it also uh, led, I might add, to uh, the most unknown war in American history, which lasted on and off for about 20 years. The bitter, cruel, guerrilla Seminole War in Florida, which was the principal responsibility of much of the United States Army all through uh, the 1820s and 30s. Uh, and uh, that's the famous Osceola was the great Indian uh, leader down in Florida. Um, uh, and, uh, 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 and, you know, so anyway, the debate, the debate was essentially, the debate was brought to a head by the founder of the state of Michigan, Lewis Cass, who had been the territorial governor and then became a uh, senator from the state of, uh, of, of Michigan and went on to become presidential candidate later on. And Lewis Cass, um, you know, kind of a product of the Yankee exodus, the uh, whole upper Midwest here was settled largely by, you know, migrant Yankees from New, uh, spilling out of overpopulated New England. And Lewis Cass was up there in Michigan, you know, remote country, and he kind of made a study of the Indian tribes, <clears throat> and he ended up writing this great brief for the Congress uh, on, you know, the sort of what the Indian anthropology and what to do about the Indians and all the rest. And whether he meant it to be this or not, he was a Democrat, so he's coming along in the Jacksonian party. Uh, whether he meant it to be this or not, uh, Cass kind of made Indian removal an easy vote for members of Congress because he argued eloquently that, yes, the Indians, in, for their own good, need to be picked up and moved. And many, you know, otherwise um, the conscience, you know, ridden uh, members of Congress said, oh, yes, well, okay, in, th in that case, you know, we'll do it. And... Um, uh, and and uh, so you know, even we should we should not exclude high-minded Yankees from you know this from this d debate uh, about about Native Americans. It's not just the pioneers or the Westerners or the racist Southerners or what have you. It was the whole nation, uh, and um, uh, and here it was uh, a, 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 a a territorial governor and senator from the one of the most northern states in the, in the country that ended up giving justification um, to uh, Andrew Jackson and his largely Southern Democratic Party. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Brett.